Welcome to Trillions. I'm Joel Weber. And I'm Eric Balchunas. Eric, uh, one of our favorite guests so far has been Rachel Evans, who's a reporter in Bloomberg News who covers ETFs. And Rachel went on a little bit of a field trip for us. We outsourced an episode. <laughs> we did. To Rachel. <laughs> this was an easy one. Yeah. Um, and I like it because a lot of our conversations so far have been pretty broad. Where we've covered several tickers. This is really drilling down into one particular ETF, and it goes to the story of how somebody launches an ETF. So it's it's kind of a deep dive into two things at once. And Rachel, which ETF is this? This is the MAGA fund. MAGA. That's a, that is a ticker, <laughs> right? It is. And I know there's probably a lot of people there triggered right about now. But before you tune out, this is the Make America Great Again slogan and uh, connected with Trump. But before you tune out, this is an ETF, I think, a little ahead of its time. It is basically what's called partisan investing. And I I know it might not be where we want things to go, but it's kind of where things are going. And it's sort of trying to divide the stock market into left and right. And this one is on the right side, and you sort of have ESG is more on the left side. And Rachel, this was really your idea. What was it about MAGA that resonated with you? Why did you want to do this episode? I think it's always interesting when someone comes onto the ETF scene and is doing something completely different. Uh, We hadn't seen anything political in the way of ETFs until uh, this MAGA fund came out. It was really the first to kind of actually propose a strategy in which you buy companies that are donating to Republican candidates. That struck me as a really interesting uh, strategy, and I was kind of curious to see whether it worked and exactly how that idea came about. I think this is a great ETF to drill down into. Actually, the ticker to me was just... Just grand slam home run. And that does matter with these type of niche ETFs. I have to think this guy might be located down south. Uh, where did you have to go to interview him? <laughs> you wouldn't be wrong. So this involved me getting up at a very, very early hour to get a flight down to Dallas-Fort Worth. So Hal Lambert, who has set up Point Bridge Capital, he runs the, the MAGA fund. To give it its full name, it's actually the Point Bridge GOP Stock Tracker ETF. But MAGA is somewhat more catchy. Uh, so I met him at his offices in downtown Fort Worth. It's a, a nice little town, actually. It's quite sort of uh, historic. There's a nice old center You've got a kind of old courthouse that's quite pretty, lots of kind of shops and restaurants around. But I obviously chose the worst day to go down to Texas. It was cold. It was wet. It was windy. It wasn't exactly great timing on my part. And when did he launch the ETF? So the fund started in September um, of 2017. So we have now had just over six months of performance to to evaluate. Um, So it seemed like a good time to go down and see how that fund uh, started life and and how it's been doing uh, since its launch. This week on Trillions, the man who made MAGA. So I'm here to see Hal Lambert on the 15th floor. Do I... Elevator A. Elevator A. Thank you. Hal looks the consummate conservative professional. Think open neck shirt, chinos and a plaid blazer. And blonde hair worn slightly long and swept back. A look not dissimilar to President Trump's. Hello. Hello, Good to see you again. Good to see you again. How's it going? Thanks for coming down. Thank you for having me in. Appreciate appreciate it. it. It's great to see you. Good. It's nice to get type, I hope. (laughs) His office in downtown Fort Worth has a similar vibe. It's all black leather and chrome, with a picture of his daughter set on the table next to an award for Best ETF Ticker from this year's ETF.com Awards. I started by asking him to take me back to the beginning and tell me how he'd first come up with the idea for political investing. I was sitting at my desk here in the office that we're in. I was watching the news, and that morning, Target had come out and announced that they were going to uh, allow uh, anyone of any gender to use the dressing rooms and restrooms at their facilities. So how are they identified for that day? They could, they could change in the dressing rooms. And I saw this, and I was like, ah, that's going to be very negative for Target stock. People were upset about it. I've got two daughters. We shop at Target. I mean, they're going to go buy swimsuits at Target. They're going to change in the dressing room. It's kind of a weird scenario. This morning, a petition against the retail giant Target is gaining a lot of momentum. Nearly 850,000 people have already signed a boycott pledge by the American Family Association over Target's bathroom policy. People are boycotting Target, and they don't realize they own it in their mutual funds. Once President Trump won... 
and I started seeing more of what was going on politically as far as corporate America, you know, I kind of moved into that mode of how do I, how do I capitalize for investors, their ability to uh, invest in companies that have their political views. Once you come up with this idea, an exchange-traded fund seemed like the natural solution. The, the reason I thought the ETF approach was the best way forward was because it's the most scalable in my mind. Clients don't have to have an account at Point Bridge Capital. Uh, they can have an account at Schwab. They can have an account at TD Ameritrade. They can have an account at UBS. Basically, wherever they have a brokerage account, they can purchase it. Hal's idea to turn his political views into a fund wasn't new per se. Values-based investing has been around for years for folk who want to avoid energy producers, tobacco companies or weapons manufacturers, for example. You might have heard these types of strategies called ESG, short for environmental, social and governance, or socially responsible. And these types of products have become all the rage in recent years. But Hal saw a gap in the market for investors with a different set of values, a conservative set of values. He wasn't coming at this cold, Hal's been involved in Republican politics for more than a decade, most recently running a super PAC for Ted Cruz's tilt at the presidency in 2016, a battle that President Trump and his MAGA slogan ultimately won. Uh, There were the ESG funds, and those ESG funds are typically mostly left. There's nothing out there uh, from from the conservative or Republican side, but through my work in politics, I realized, you know, what really matters is the money in politics. So... That's really what I ought to do is see, well, where are they giving their money? Because that's really what's determining how people are getting elected and whether people are getting elected. And so that's really what started. I was like, I'll I'll follow the money and see what that leads to. Thus began a series of phone calls to find out what it would take to realise his funds and how he would get approval from the regulators for something known as exemptive relief. So I just started calling people and saying, you know, and learning how to do it. There are different types of incubators out there that can that are kind of turnkey approaches to launching ETFs, and I basically just learned that market uh, through conversations with people. And I realized that really what I wanted to do was get my own exemptive relief, and then basically I created a, a timeline. I have a whiteboard over here where I put up on the whiteboard. Okay, what do I need to do first? I, I mean, if you want to walk, we can walk over to the whiteboard. Yeah. I'll show you the whiteboard. So this is the, the whiteboard in which you sketched out kind yeah, of the, the process to market. Right. And then I made, I made decisions on kind of, you can see these are all, you know, you've got U.S. Bank, you've got CBO. So how lined up the custodian, S&P, spoke with market makers and authorized participants to make sure that the fund would trade smoothly on an exchange and that investors could put their cash in and get it out again. But one crucial ingredient was still missing, something we talk a lot about on this show, the ticker. I decided I knew I wanted the ticker to be MAGA. So I, I called up uh, my contact at CBOE and said, hey, I, you know, I need to reserve this ticker. Well, they tell me that ticker's already taken. So I was like, oh, man. And they go, but, but I don't think they're going to use it. So let me, let me check with them. Sure enough, they were. They said, "Yeah, we're we're not going to use this ticker," and I figured they would probably say, "Hey, you know, give us some money and you can have the ticker." But they didn't do that, so it was pretty nice. It was pretty quick, actually. Within a day or so, we exchanged emails. They're like, "Yeah, we're fine to release it." They felt like the ticker might be a little too uh, a little too hot. <laughs> but you didn't, obviously. Like, no. when did you first think that Marga? That's the ticker for me. After, obviously, after President Trump won the election. That's a campaign slogan, and I just thought that, that that ticker would be an interesting way to let the public know that this is a Republican ETF. Were you trying to come up with other alternatives that would, would fit it? I, I, I was, and in fact, another alternative was GOP, and that ticker was taken as well. And that ticker had only been taken, if I recall, maybe just a few weeks before um, before I had called about it. So that ticker was gone, and so I was like, wow, this is... Um, this could be a problem because I know tickers, tickers are really important in the ETF world. People don't really care what the names are. It's all about the ticker. So, you know, I'll say, well, the names, the, you know, the Point Bridge GOP Stock Tracker ETF, but the ticker is MAGA. So that's, what, that's the way you need to think about it. All told, it took about seven months from making his first calls to starting the fund. 
Texas-based Point Bridge Capital is launching its first ETF, and it's yes. aimed at investing in GOP-friendly companies. Mega, baby. I it's understand that you've got, what, about 150 companies, with all of which are sympathetic to Republican causes. Well, give me a As a marketing idea, it's brilliant. <laughs> As a marketing idea, it's brilliant. I don't I just want to understand more about my portfolio. It's a longer it's... conversation. We appreciate you being here. So how's the fund doing? Well, its report card is somewhat mixed. The fund has $39 million in assets. That's not nothing, but it's somewhat below the $50 to $100 million that ETFs typically need to break even. It ended 2017 with strong returns, but those have lagged somewhat this year. It's easy to see why when you look at Marga's holdings. Remember, these are all companies that donate to Republican candidates. And, drilling down, you can see that the portfolio is heavily tilted towards oil and gas companies. This means that the fund thrives when energy does well, but it also suffers when the sector struggles. The opposite is true of technology, in which the fund is very underweight. But Marga also owns some companies that might give Conservatives pause. Berkshire Hathaway and Goldman Sachs, both run by CEOs that have expressed socially liberal views in the past, are also in the mix. I asked Hal how investors react when they learn that these companies are part of the Marga fund. You know, you can have a CEO that's a Democrat, you can have a CEO that's, that's a big liberal, and they can spout off about things. Lloyd Blankfein talking about Donald Trump's Twitter doesn't affect things as much as Goldman Sachs PAC giving money to Republican candidates. <laughs> so um, I'll, take the, I'll take the dollars given all day long over uh, an interview where he, he criticizes somebody. So I think companies um, say things publicly and then they do things differently um, than what they're saying publicly. I found this argument particularly interesting. On the one hand, it makes a lot of sense. Money is something far more tangible than talk. But it also seems to contradict one of Hal's pitches to possible buyers, namely that companies, like Target for example, damage their share price when they express liberal political views. Using his methodology, the fund still owns some of these companies. It also made me wonder how much you can tell about a company's ideology from the dollars it donates. To dig into this further, I turn to Michael Yusim, a professor of management at the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School, who researches leadership and decision making. Is business giving ideologically driven? That is, you want to support parties that say advocate policies you want yourself, or is it access driven? You want access to individuals who, especially, are in positions of chairs of House and Senate committees, and most top executive money has long gone to the Republican Party, no surprise there. But there are periods where more than half of the PAC money over which they preside actually goes to Democrats. There's also the cost. The fund charges 72 basis points, or $7.20 for every $1,000 invested. That's significantly higher than the average of 49 basis points for ETFs in the U.S. So why might an investor decide it's the right product for them? To find out, I spoke to another academic, Maya Statman, who specialises in behavioural finance at Santa Clara University. In finance, we have a tendency to separate the production of returns from their consumption. That is, we say, first make the most money, however, whatever it takes, then use it to buy stuff to satisfy you or to support the causes that you want. And, and that is silly because finance just, just made itself very narrow in saying the goal must be getting the highest return because people like the, the expressive and emotional benefits of being true to their values, not just pretending to be true to their values. I asked Hal about this motivation and whether it could be one of the reasons people buy his fund. I'm not sure how much people are making investments necessarily based on um, being part of a club, but I, I mean, I'd certainly be happy for that. And I, I think that, you know, friends do tend to talk to each other at cocktail parties. Hey, what are you buying? What are you looking at from a, you know investment standpoint? So hopefully we'll get to the point where that's a, a topic that comes up. I'd certainly welcome it. Why do you think people get more upset about politics these days? Do you think that polarisation is a positive thing or a negative thing? Well, I, I, I don't think necessarily polarisation is a good thing. I think it's great for people to have different views. 
I wish people would then be able to still be friends and and have the different views, right? So, I guess I ask because I mean, is there an argument there that you know something like the MAGA fund mm -hmm. is sort of capitalizing on that polarization? I, I don't know that I would say it's capitalizing on it. I, I'd say it's giving it investors a vehicle that they haven't had as a way to uh, invest based on things, uh, based on political views. So capitalize isn't necessarily the right word for it. I'd say it's more trying to keep, create an opportunity for people to do something that they don't have. Did you know there are a lot of companies that heavily support liberal politicians like Hillary by donating millions to Democrats? There's now a way to invest without owning these stocks. Hal Lambert and his company, Point Bridge Capital, created the first... Now that his fund is up and running, Hal's main focus is on making investors aware of it. In that, he has a different approach to many of the larger firms, taking spots on conservative talk radio, for example. And of course, the ticker is MAGA, MAGA, M-A-G-A. Go to investpolitically.com and learn about MAGA. It lets you own the top 150... Republicans. One thing I'm doing differently than most ETFs is I'm not trying to go out and have a bunch of wholesalers hit the different brokerage houses. I think mine, mine is going to be driven more by investors calling up and saying, I want to buy this versus necessarily their advisor calling them and saying, hey, you should buy this. You know, I, I've had someone say to me, I think they, they said to me, yeah, you know, that's a that's a really interesting niche product. I'm like, well, you know, it's really not niche. <laughs> I said 65 million people voted for Donald Trump, you know, so there's a big market out there. It certainly found some high profile support among Hal's political colleagues since President Trump's inauguration. I know Don Jr. now, so I didn't know him prior, but uh, we've become acquainted and I don't know. I guess we could say we're friends. What does he think of the Marguerite ETF? Oh, he likes it. Yeah, yeah he told me he likes it, like, loves the idea, and uh, I think he's a fan. How about your old boss, Ted Cruz? He likes it. He likes the idea. I don't know if he's bought it. I'm, you know what? I'm, I'm going to have to call up uh, You know, his wife. His wife's in the investment field, so I think I need to talk to Heidi and say, hey, you, got, you need to look into this a little bit more. Have you put your money into it? Oh, yes. You know, all of my liquid retirement is in it. My, my mother's in it. My wife's in it. There was just one final thing I needed to know before leaving Hal in Fort Worth. Do you have the hat? <laughs> I have a, I, I'll tell you what I have. I have a MAGA ETF hat. I'll show it to you before we leave. But I do have a red hat that, I, that I've made up that says MAGA ETF on it. So it's kind of a, your, your it's, own brand? It's my own, it's my own brand of the, of the hat, yes. So not, so not the Trump hat? Not the actual Trump hat. But I'll, in fair, I, I'm not a big uh, slogan guy. I don't, have a, I don't have a Ted Cruz hat either. I, I don't have a, I didn't do a lot of the slogan stuff. But now you're in the business of slogans. I know, now I need to, I, I know I've had to revamp my thoughts on that. Rachel, what do you think the biggest takeaways for you were? biggest takeaway for me was really just that this is an, a very interesting idea uh, that, that kind of, you know, the fact that you can try and invest in a way that aligns with your political values, I thought was a really novel concept. I'm not sure whether it's something that um, I necessarily think is a, a great development for the world per se, in that I think, you know, when you look at where things are politically these days, you know, we have so much polarisation uh, between right and left and whether the right and left talk to each other enough anymore, I think is, is, is an area for debate. I do wonder whether, you know, when you get into investing politically as well as kind of donating politically or going to rallies, whether that kind of takes that polarisation one step further. But I think the idea about investing according to your political values as well as you know maybe your morals or, or you know, whether you think that uh, energy stocks are going up or, or whether the government's going to build roads in your, your town. I think that's an interesting idea. I mean the part that interests me a little bit is just that if if you want to build it you can build it and if it works it works and if it doesn't it doesn't and like if somebody wants to invest in that they can invest in that but here's this guy who had an idea and he went out and did it. Right I mean that's when you look at the ETF marketplace it's a democracy. It's not something that necessarily you have to kind of be coming from a, a BlackRock or a Vanguard to get success. If you have an idea and you go through the right kind of process, you can see your fund realized. And then it's up to the marketplace whether it succeeds. I, I'm a little more bullish on this ETF than I think most people for two reasons. One, if this thing starts to become something that Sean Hannity or the conservative crowd starts talking about, you know, every time somebody on the left says something bad, they want to boycott the other side. This is a way to act with your dollars. And if it starts making its way in conservative circles, that's half the country as an audience. The second thing is 
This is heavy energy and industrials and has no tech. If the FANG stocks crumble, they've had a few like hits, but they're back. If they crumble, this thing has uh, a lot of stocks that are uh, more on the value side. And if it starts to outperform and rip past the S&P 500, it could, it could get assets just because it's uh, outperforming. So it's got a couple things that could garner assets that are legitimate, in my opinion. Yeah, that's one thing that, that Hal mentioned to me is that when he ran kind of back tests on, on this fund and kind of how it performed in the past, I think pleasantly surprised to find that it didn't really correlate with the S&P 500, which when obviously you're using the S&P 500 as your base universe, you'd expect there potentially to be more overlap there. But it seemed that, you know, there is either outperformance or underperformance. It's not really just tracking the S&P. At the beginning, we talked about how ESG is sort of on the left side of the map and MAGA might be on the right. It really shows in the numbers. If you look, there's only 8% overlap between the two big ESG ETFs and MAGA. That is not a lot considering they're both large caps. I personally think if ESG went and sort of called itself liberal values, I I think it might get off the ground faster and just recognize that's its audience anyway. But anyway, this is fascinating to see if the stock market continues to get divided via politics. Pretty crazy also that somebody had the ticker and relinquished it. Uh, You don't know who actually had the ticker. It wasn't the guy who, uh, there's another uh, issuer who has GOP and Dem. I pushed Hal to tell me and he he wouldn't name names. But uh, I mean, it's it's interesting that you pick on that because from my understanding of it you know when you have ETF issuers out there that are pondering different ideas and come up with you know a a three four even five letter kind of word that seems like it might encapsulate an investment thesis you can go out and you can reserve that ticker with the exchanges for a certain period of time yeah it just seems like a the land grab somebody's just got to be land grabbing this like dot com era urls yeah, I remember back when Bill Gross uh, first came out, his ETF was TRXT or something. Really bad. And eight months later, he got Bond, which was smart. MAGA, I'm a little shocked, just because partisan investing is very new. Uh, I, I, we were just talking before we started how I remember two years ago, this kind of thing just wouldn't have entered my head in covering ETFs. As an it's, option even, right? No, yeah. I, nobody was doing this or talking about this kind of thing. I think it really wasn't until this past election where it's become more obvious in a way. I think that's a good point. I mean, I think society generally has become more political. If you look at the news stories that, you know, we as reporters are are covering on a daily basis, you know, so much of the stock market moves are are driven by politics um, these days. You know, you you can't really write a story without incorporating something that, you know, President Trump or the cabinet or Congress has said or done because it's impacting how the the markets move on a much greater level, I think, in this administration than, than some of the ones immediately previous. So when it comes to politics being part of our daily lives it's more and more present rachel thank you so much just love the fact that you're with us and doing cool stuff like this thanks for joining us on trillions thanks for having me thanks for listening to trillions until next time you can find us on the bloomberg terminal bloomberg.com apple podcasts and wherever else you want to listen to us we'd love to hear from you we're on twitter she's at Rachel Evans underscore NY. I'm at Joel Weber Show. He's at Eric Balchunas. Trillions is produced by Magnus Hendrickson. Francesca Levy is the head of Bloomberg Podcasts. Bye.